Hello everyone, today we talk about the Roman Empire in Augustian times and more specifically of the peoples that lived at its frontiers. So this is a very wide topic as you can understand and we uh, don't have time but to approach it now just at, at an introductory level. Um, and uh, But it's nevertheless very important to discuss and in which we will come back uh, several times. We already kind of discussed this broadly here and there in the other videos we made about Roman history um, at this point on Schwerpunkt but uh, it's something uh, very important because it's fundamental to understand the nature of the political and military control that effectively was exercised by the Empire and at this time actually by all the other empires in the world let's say in you know uh, uh, not much in spaces, but in times, rather, that are very different from our own, um, and that, uh, in to which uh, other factors, like, for instance, technology, uh, you know, the, the evolution of society, etc., brought to very different uh, means of control of, uh, of territory. And, in fact, the key uh, concept to understand here is that when we talk about uh, the Roman Imperium, the Empire, as we mean it for, for the Romans, we're not talking about a, uh, actually, even, uh, um, uh, we're not talking about a territorial dominion. Um, territory effectively was important, and it was, we will see now how effectively there were uh, boundaries, you can't talk even about borders in some cases, where the limes was fortified and very often also uh, in along uh, natural borders think about the Rhine or the Danube uh, in Europe or uh, the desert in North Africa or in the Near East or even the Channel because at this time Britain was uh, was not uh, was not yet under the Roman control um, and but the the real power was exercised by the Romans was not on land on a surface on something you can measure in squared kilometers and miles wherever you count them like uh, but effectively on peoples this is particularly important to understand it's uh, basically the the key concept you can uh, you you have to approach if you want to understand the, the, the political and military control that Rome had on its um, on its empire and even on the territory as a matter of fact because uh, here we could <laughs> you know um, throw in all the um, you know mo all the imaginable clause of its and uh, concept around the fact that we were talking about not controlling mm, you know, like physical pieces of land but actual people that live on there um, but it, it's it's important also because the way we tell the history of the Roman Empire is still uh, radically influenced by the 19th century um, paradigms let's say that we have uh, through which historiography at the time started looking uh, the Roman Empire as think about Gibbon Mm. Uh, or uh, or others, but in general, the, the way we still s see in many ways um, the, um, the the actual political and military power that effectively is an idea that we have built chiefly with the, the birth of the nation state, where you have fundamentally a state that is allegedly homogeneous within its borders, that is controlled by a unique government, which is you know generally true at least with the nation state as it developed from the 19th century onwards um, and that has actual physical borders that you say you can say it effectively that one millimeters uh, one millimeter away is you know uh, the territory of one country and the, the other millimeter you, you stay in is is uh, belongs to, to another one if you are on, on the actual border um, when it comes to to the ancient world but also naturally there are many important reasons why we started to think like that mainly you know th it's we're talking about technological means that also had to entail the, the weapons and the means of control um, the in the ancient world as in medieval times things were very very different as you have to understand the same concept of limes that we often um, um, you know we, u we often use uh, when we s uh, when we talk about the empire etc so identifying a border with limes fundamentally is something that probably the, the Romans themselves uh, didn't use. The, the Romans had another um, term that is called uh, monumentum that fundamentally means, uh, I mean it's difficult to um, to translate, um, uh, but it, it basically has to do with, uh, in, 
in English, it's even more difficult to find an actual equivalent. It's like something that you keep, that you arm, that you strengthen, right? You know, when you want to reinforce, etc. And this was represented chiefly not by the physical border, that even from, from a certain point onwards, the Romans started, you know, more or less to build. Uh, because there is the narrative, you know, that f fundamentally that the true Limes as a uh, continuous fortification was started being built from the Flamian age, the Flamian era, and, the, and that fundamentally, especially under the Antonines, after the, the regression of the, uh, the frontiers, uh, there was a further um, the fortification with permanent uh, structures, etc. But if you look at it in, in, in single perspective, realize that even the, the, there is nothing like, you know, a... Um, the, the, the great Chinese wall, for instance, or something like that. Also because it was useless. You don't have to think that you are more intelligent than a person that lived 2,000 years ago, or that you knew, uh, or that you know effectively how, you know, uh, best, what, what it, it had to, uh, to be done, because you don't. Just remember it. Um, and the, uh, the point there is that what they did was effectively what worked. And these physical borders were literally the least important thing that at that time you, you could, you could uh, in fact count on. They were just on a uh, help, on, a, on an auxilium to control, to, to physically stop certain penetrations in the Roman territory, etc. But effectively they didn't work, and especially when the Romans got, especially on the defensive, with from from the late second and the uh, f effectively with, with the crisis of the third century, um, they they s they reverse to a uh, so-called in-depth uh, system of defense that actually was such even kind of before. Um, before making this video, perhaps I should have uh, warned you a, a little bit about uh, Lutwak's works that have been written on the. Um, on the Roman Empire and on the great strategy of the Roman and the Byzantine Empire, two books that are actually very interesting, but they are partly misleading and can be profusely, um, profitably, so, sorry, uh, criticized because they tend to stress this idea of the border as such, while they don't take excessively into consideration other aspects. But let's just say for now that, um, and because there is an agenda there, um, and the but today we're talking about actually peoples outside the empire, or at, or at least at the frontiers, because this is, in fact, you see, I, I also f just fell into the trick, you know, I thinking that idea that was a within and an outside, that at the time was not conceived. Uh, it was not conceived in many ways. The, uh, the monumentum basically consisted of the Roman legions. The Roman legions were, the, as you know, some of the most uh, efficient uh, armies of the, uh, the ancient world, um, they're renowned because of their discipline, professionalism, uh, at this time still loyalty, and uh, basically the, the fact that it could be replenished at this time, to, that there was any crisis of recruitment now in this um, period in Augustian times, um, so that not even, you know, defeats like, you know, the, the one of the Battle of Teutoburg, uh, Teutoburg Forest, or not even the ones that had just previously happened, like the one of Kara against the Parthians, could, could, could affect. The empire was kind of safe. There were major uh, rebellions, like the Illyrian, the Great Illyrian Revolt, was something, you know, something very serious. But the Romans basically managed to to absorb everything, to to deploy their military strength in a way they, uh, albeit you know, with the difficulties of the case, to put an end to all these problems. And the Augustian Augustus was a uh, you know. Uh, one of the, not just the greatest politician of uh, in all history, but also a, contrary advice to what is commonly believed, a, a great strategist and even tactician. He wrote a book, uh, a book on tactics as well, and unfortunately is being lost. But he effectively created, not just in the political uh, domain, but also in the military one, a system that effectively held for, you know, for fundamentally three centuries. With all, you know, yeah, the, the later crisis effectively, but it's not something you find so easily in history, especially at this time, where systems went disrupted and declining pr pretty easily. So the Romans had found the right formula that was, however, a pragmatic formula. It wasn't an absolute, like, you know, once again, we could throw in <laughs> lots of Clausewitz and concepts in here. Uh, there are many people uh, were convinced of, of certain things about the Romans, thinking that, like, they were the best absolute thing that ever happened, also in terms of military organization efficiency. The Roman Empire uh, kept a very high standard, that is something you can't find also in other, in other countries and other empires. Um, 
but it's still you know something that it's measured on pragmatism that say the Romans didn't do uh, more or less than what they effectively needed to do um, and they did it pretty well because they were that they were in the right conditions in the right moment to, to do it uh, Rome at this time was effectively not pressured by uh, great enemies we will see now that even the major uh, threats let's say let's we want to call them this way to the empire were at this time in the Augustan period actually pretty pretty small uh, not that things uh, you know that the Romans had to lower the guard ever but still you know things got sensibly worse let's say in, in towards the, the third especially the fourth, uh, the fourth century etc but at this time Rome was effectively controlling what was the center of the world at the time, at least talking about the, the western half of the Eurasian continent and North Africa, Rome was unopposed. Um, and Rome was effectively controlling the known world. Mm -hmm. There is this kind of, uh, I don't know even how to call it, a Romanchism or revivalism for, for saying, oh well, but they didn't conquer Scotland, they didn't conquer Germany. Yeah, okay, but effectively they were still controlling the known world and and they were effectively right in thinking about that and the reason as we will see now that for which they didn't conquer even this lands it's not that you know they couldn't effectively that simply that was not convenient to them and they didn't do it because they weren't stupid uh, they tried because obviously they they wanted even to test because it's not easy at this time even to assess the strengths of a you know of a population of a territory just think also the geographical knowledge is radically different from from, from the way the, the one we have now and and this wasn't really a um you know a, you know a, a, a big problem in itself but let's say that that i don't know in, in augustian times uh, the romans believed effectively that the distance between um, between I don't know the Rhine and and Russia was like effectively one third than the one that they 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 believed at least they didn't actually know Russia which is interesting because um, it's quite a big thing but since it was not uh, inserted into their cir trade circuits etc was effectively the most important thing Rome uh, cared about they didn't give a damn they knew that China existed they didn't know that let's say the Urals existed so this is particularly particularly important also reveals to you what, what the view was. And the function of the Roman military that at this time, by the way, wasn't even so large in size. I mean, the, the legions were a substantial military power in itself, but they weren't actually many men. And if you look at the world, um, at the world population of the empire now, it reached, you know, a substantial um, amount of, of, of people's uh, of inhabitants and but you know it was effectively easy to control these areas and th th the importance of the in this sense of the money monumentum rather than the milis is that the limes sorry is that the romans true religions didn't just control what was within the roman borders they also controlled what was outside the roman borders so when we look at i don't know i, I always make this, this example with uh, especially the rhine frontier that is kind of the most um, you know it, it, it's easier to understand it because the Romans effectively stationed you know it's it, the, the Rhine is is not a, a huge as a big European river uh, one of the major European rivers but it's still you know you know confined let's say to an area that the Danube is sensibly uh, longer for instance and also passes through much more heterogeneous lands um, but you look at the Rhine, you see all the, the legions were stationed there, and what you have to think, it's not that these were just old soldiers pushing back these terrible Germans of the outside, they were pushing, not at all. Basically, there were legions that were stationed there for centuries, doing literally nothing, or at least uh, there were um, very long moments of peace, of inaction, where the legions remained there, remained effective, by the way, because also the, the Roman training was military training was like a, a, a real war military experience um, um, and um, in, in it by itself and the Roman legions were there just because they were controlling both the Gauls and the Germans yes because the Romans at this point didn't didn't conceive it like you know there was a border they simply said we stationed troops there so we keep at bay the Germans and the Gauls and effectively, even if you look at the enmity that has been propagandated for nationalistic reasons once again in the 19th century, how many mistakes in the 19th century from an ideological point of view? I actually like the 19th century a lot. 
and was actually a great century also in terms of ideological achieve, uh, you know, intellectual, scientific achievements, etc. But it was effectively a moment in which we, we needed to draw the past on the base of modern nations, which was probably one of the most stupid things in absolute terms you can do, especially for, for times like those that effectively had a very few to do with modern nations in terms of local identities, etc. And uh, in this case, um, the idea is that the empire was universal was divine, um, and uh, it was meant to, co to, co to rule all over the world. And the Germans that effectively rebelled after having been conquered for 20 years by the Romans and kicked them out of Germany, and the Romans tried uh, at some time to, to recover some land, etc., but effectively they decided at one point, okay, let's stay just from this side and just let's, let's, let's control them at, at the distance, weren't in fact enemies of Rome I I in absolute terms. They wouldn't be even later. You know, even during the Great Migration era, it's not that the Germans had any particular hatred towards the Romans themselves. They effectively didn't care. They effectively cared actually about the empire in itself because they recognized in a completely pagan fashion, it was normal at the time, that the empire of the Romans was the right one because it, you know, it was so large and powerful that it had the right gods, the one that effectively even the same Germans venerated. This is the worshipped. Uh, by the way, this is also dramatically important to understand. Uh, all these population, Indo-European populations believed basically the same thing, that there is a celestial deity of the sky that confers military glory to the humans, for which divine glory, uh, with, uh, I mean, earthly gro glory has nothing to do with the actual, um, you know, uh, military merit of the individual that naturally has to, to deserve this, but it's a gift of, of the gods that allow mankind to triumph. That's why that's why effectively the, the, during the Roman triumph there was the guy behind the, the victorious general uh, whispering in his ear so you just remember that you're ju you're ju remember you're just a man right because you're not God and um, effectively uh, this triumph ended at the uh, uh, temple of, of Jupiter uh, Capitolinus and in, in, in this sense of giving back to to the gods what had been given to, to, to the victorious general in order to respect the celestial deity and all. So even the Germans in this perspective believed that the Romans had the right gods and they were extremely proud when they came to occupy Roman lands because they felt they were participating to this greatness and this is something that they narrated also during the Middle Ages and we will see now, you know, you, you have, we have been talking a lot about these topics on Schwerpunkt you can go check them out, especially in migration in our playlist, there's plenty of that. But even at those times, the idea is that actually half of Germany was pro-Roman, the other half was against the Romans. And the idea that is that the Romans were effectively playing into German politics, they decided which kings were elected, which ones they had to fall. So there was effectively a control there that th Rome could, could uh, enact simply by stationing all those uh, um, allegiance on the right, which is just an example. So the control is on people, so it's not on land. Naturally, land has an importance. We will see now also why the Romans stopped to the borders that they did. But effectively, the most important thing was to control the people, so they were also outside. Because in the Roman perspective, the center of the world was Rome, all around the Mediterranean, and this um, regions, especially the ones of the far north, like Britain, said were considered like you know a, a, a place. It was so far and so savage and so wild and so primitive that nobody even cared if Rome conquered it or not. Actually, the Romans were quite proud of conquering Britain because, according to the uh, classical myths, not even gods had ventured into Britain because you know it was so far away th at the uh, frontiers of the world, fundamentally the borders of the world that. You know, there was nothing to, and and the Romans did. So were not they were the gods didn't venture. Did the Romans, the Roman legions did to under the Roman eagle that was the symbol of the celestial deity of the sky. So always with the supreme divine guidance. But looking in this sense, uh, this is a just a bit of an introduction that is needed in, in a, uh, absolutely every time to approach these topics. We have to look beyond the frontiers because so at this time Rome was controlling peoples, even within its borders, same for the Gauls, I mean it's not that when, I don't know, the, the Romans, uh, just an example of the Gauls, the conquered Gaul, the Gauls were exterminated, 
the Gauls kept living where they were. You know, like lots of them were were massacred, like hundreds of thousands. Even more were were sold as slaves, but still the large majority, the overwhelming majority of the Gallic population was was Gallic, were Celtic, and blended in with with the Romans, with the, the colonists that the Romans sent from Italy and so on. But this is that was how the case was. The, the Gauls effectively sometimes even um, just uh, I think once rebelled in full. Um, I don't remember exactly when, but just in in this era, basically, if I, uh, I think it was the first uh, century AD, the beginnings. Um, but just to be exterminated, so that, and, and and this control in Rome was effectively based on deterrence. I mean, having an army there that basically froze any possibility of, of of rebellion, and that's how it happened. Not because the local peoples were happy to be under Rome. They they of course they enjoyed for for those time standards a certain peace, a certain stability. Rome was mostly interested into trade functioning. And you may say, well, okay, well, but these populations had been ins practically enslaved or massacred to be, yeah, okay, but they were still living within that world, and they kind of, you know, relatively, um, you know, some things went better, depending from what perspectives you want to see. It's not that, you know, Iron Age, um, I'd say pre-Roman Gaul was a such a beautiful place to live in. You know, the cows were slaughtering each other effectively, the Germans were invading, so it's, it was not such a great thing. Rome effectively avoided, for instance, the German conquest of Gaul. Uh, it kind of made the local elites participating to the to the uh, to the government, etc. And of course, the rest of the majority of of the population lived, you know, miserably like they had been living before. But who cares about the majority of the population? We're talking about empires. We're not talking about uh, charity uh, institutions. And this is effectively what any other empire in the world did, but what not other uh, any other empire in the world but Rome did was effectively co-opting the local aristocracies to participate uh, into the to the Roman Senate actually as Roman citizens with the process of Romanization, which is effectively what actually allowed the Roman Empire to exist in the first place. Otherwise, the Romans would have basically stopped to Italy, um, and uh, that meant to put uh, these regions of uh, surrounding the Mediterranean in contact with the system of government, etc. Gaul especially was a great beneficiary of this, where Gaul is also uh, a province th that remained very heavily Romanized, even in post-Roman times, it kind of um, uh, had, a, in the sense, a relatively positive history. But I'm not advoca advocating now for, for what the Romans did, I'm just, you know, telling you that th there was much worse, at least for those time standards. So, the the concept in here is that Rome is expanding. Rome is theoretically at this point with Augustian times. There is a big deal of consolidation as well as expansion. Um, and what you see even in previous times from the first century BC is that starting especially from the years 76, 75 BC is that the I, all over the world, I mean, literally, the, the world of the time, there is a, a, an ever-growing, an ever-frequent presence of Roman coins that leaves no doubt at all. Rome was inspiring at the time to become the great, uh, you know, guardian of the world order. Mm. And uh, at the end, the, the first century BC uh, sees uh, Rome engulfed into the uh, the civil wars. Um, that are something that lasts actually pretty long. There, there's uh, the Caesar civil war, then the Caesar civil war, and then uh, the struggle between Octavian and Antonius. So uh, actually, this is a moment of great mobilization. Of, of uh, mobilization, sorry, um, millions of Roman citizens are at this time uh, on under ar get under arms throughout this period. And uh, there is also high mortality. High mortality that actually the empire. And the Roman legions, especially, will never see throughout the, the this era, th throughout the Principate before the, the third century. Um, so um, uh, o Octavian peace um, is uh, meant the the Pax Romana, as a matter of fact, to be a fatal peace. Th that means that fundamentally was a peace wanted by the gods. O Octavian. Later, Augustus, for this, for the reason, was effectively uh, presenting himself as the medium between the gods 
and uh, and the world uh, during the time. He says, "Per speak is maze." So through my, um, effectively, m uh, the um, the omens, uh, the auspices that he had uh, received from the divinity. So there was uh, even a, sac a sacral dimension that starts appearing in of the empire. We will see this in on other videos, but. Um, nevertheless, it, it is strictly connected with the Imperium. Uh, Augustus wasn't uh, claiming a divinity, but essentially a privileged relation with gods as a Roman military uh, commander, right, in the Indo-Aryan tradition. Uh, and uh, I think about his funeral with the Decursi. We've been talking about that, actually. If you go in uh, my, uh, my video, which is called um, The Roman Eagle, the one on the Roman Eagle, if you search for Schwerpunkt Roman Eagle, you can find all this explained. Uh, you can understand better this religious dimension of the empire that was effectively nothing but a, uh, um, like a secular empire, like many people believe today. Many people believe that the empire, Roman Empire, was a model, of, was a lay empire, a modernized empire, secularized empire. There's, we are not talking about Rome, if you say <laughs> anything like that. Um, and just for saying how many prejudices there, there are, even to first approach this 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 concepts freely and without prejudice basically um you know hopefully in a, in, in a neutral way to objective is a too great word because the history is very difficult the way it is but um these are important and it's important to stress the meaning of the pax romana and what this wanted to achieve in the world rome was wa wanted to be a great guardian a great pacifier a great controller mm, on the virtue of uh, of on virtue in itself, on the virtus, on the idea that you know the Romans had basically earned this control uh, through their uh, their I would say moral quality that had uh, granted uh, them by divine will the control on the known world. Mm -hmm. uh, Rome will in fact boast at this point to have reached literally the limits of the world. With Britain, with other, with, with the Sahara, with, with all this, we'll, we'll see now. So, um, this uh, there is also this other approach that basically Rome not just had conquered the whole world, but also was effectively embracing the whole world um, as to to become Rome. And this is what effectively the Romans were thinking of themselves and thinking about in this sense the, how the, the, the Roman citizenship worked and all the remuneration uh, for the, the foreigners that wanted to participate to, to the empire, etc., on the Roman success. Um, but, um, in, in, and this, once if, uh, you, you can't understand this if you don't go beyond the Roman, what do you think are the Roman borders, right? Because Let's repeat it. There weren't effectively Roman borders at this point. The Roman border, uh, the Roman borders are go as far at this time as uh, its ties are. That can be trade, culture, uh, the military, for sure. Uh, so very, very far. There are Roman temples even in, on the western coast of India, for instance. There are. Um, that's how Rome, how far Rome went, because everybody, uh, I mean, everywhere Rome went, you can find a small Roman there. I mean, even in the most isolated Algerian um, town in the desert, if the Romans had come there, they had built a small forum, a temple, baths, and, and basically to reproduce in, in a lesser scale what Rome had been. That was the idea. Then that's how proud, by the way, the Romans were about their unicity. Very often it's stressed that the Romans were sort of uh, copiers of, of, of stealers of other people's civilizations. This is completely false, um, uh, it, or at least it, it, it didn't happen like, you know, this kind of technologically driven pre prejudice is fundamentally um, constructed. The Romans effectively had created something completely new, completely original, that was in fact the, the, uh, that made them the only empire to become what it became. Um, and they were extremely proud of that, because they were abs absolutely aware, and they were right in doing so, in conceiving themselves as those who had made it and, and made it completely on their own. So, looking finally at this very based uh, frontier, uh, starting from, uh, let's go from, from, from northwest, from the north. So, 
about Britain, right? Now, the Romans didn't even quite, I, be, I believe, have a, a well understanding of what Britain was. They, they probably understood there were several islands there. Uh, Ireland got uh, known like, like a, an island on its own, but originally sometimes it was called Britain as well. <laughs> All the Irish would go crazy for this. <laughs> Sorry, it's that's not meant, but it's really how it was. And um, because yeah, they just thought it was this thing out there. Uh, they had, uh, in fact, an approximate an approximate knowledge of what th the world was beyond there, even with, with Scandinavia. They didn't quite get what was in the far north. Mm. Paradoxically, in medieval times, uh, travelers, traders. Uh, went uh, probably t to understand better this, or at least, well, probably there is also this big, this big thing that we we actually have much less about ancient times than than the overwhelming quantity of sources from medieval times, and and it's believed actually that the Romans traveled much more far, and, and not just the Romans, but actually also the Greeks, etc., before um, than we actually believe, but. At least from what we can get historically, their geographical knowledge was pretty limited in many ways. So uh, this field is mainly about speculation, sometimes what they actually knew. Uh, there is this, this the expedition, some say that, that there had been explorers went as far as Iceland and etc. But, you know, there is no actually very difficult evidence of that. Is this evidence is pretty vague and scanning. But uh, what is very known is that uh, at this point, during Augustian times, or before Augustian times in this case, Caesar had crossed the channel, right? And he had landed in Britain, actually twice. Um, the reason why Caesar from Gaul um, made these incursions into Britain and into Germany um, have also to be understood in this broader Roman strategy, strategic mindset. That is, that of course, uh, especially with Britain, Caesar went there because he hoped he could control it um, in a way or in another. Um, to conquer it, in this sense, is a pretty vague term. Many people say, oh, well, Caesar went twice to Britain, got back because Kenny was pushed back, but it's not truly really like that. Um, actually, the Romans conquered Britain pretty easily when they decided to do it for for real. What Caesar did in the case of Britain, and especially in the case of Germany, was to go there to show what Rome could do. Um, and this was so effective; it had such a uh, you know a, a good outcome that, in fact, the Britons remained effectively a sort of client state of Rome until Augustian times. And um, when they, you know, the internal balance was fundamentally uh, altered, uh, messed up, and uh, with with Clodius, you have we have the the, con the effective conquest of Britain. This is an, uh, yet another proof of the fact that Rome didn't actually care to, I mean, go literally there with the army as long as trade and political control was um, was functioning on these peoples. Um, so these populations were extremely impressed by Rome. Uh, it goes without saying. They had never seen anything like that. They never seen s armies like those. They had never, you know, been crushed so heavily. In Germany, especially, uh, Caesar made, you know, massive slaughters to show, you know, look, now we have arrived here and we dictate law. And effectively, the Germans, until the, um, you know, from, from there on, I mean, effectively, Caesar had invaded Gaul to officially to stop the German invasion of, of Gaul. Um, Caesar obtained that and kicked the, uh, basically the, the remains of the Germans that had entered Gaul across the Rhine, and even crosses the Rhine. He astonishes the Germans with this mi astonishing mil Roman military skills in engineering. He crosses the, the Rhine with this amazing uh, bridge. The, the Germans had never seen anything like that. I mean, just a Roman camp was an achievement. These populations bas couldn't have, they didn't have the, the, the engin engineeristic, uh, engineering know-how, basically. And they remained there, east of the Rhine, without saying anything, until the, the Romans basically decided to invade Germany, eventually, and to, and, um, and to, to achieve it, actually. Um, so, um, the, the contacts with Britain after Caesar had gone there, were kind of, uh, you know, rare. At this point, the Britons know that the Romans were there, and they kind of stayed uh, calm, because they d definitely had in contact with Rome. Uh, but you can't say that the direct contacts were relatively few, you know, the ones between the Britain proper and, 
in the Roman provinces, but they existed, right? So uh, Rome watches the Britons, looks at their political transformations that trigger wars between the, the, the Brit uh, British, uh, say, call it this way, Britonic, uh, say better, uh, kingdoms. And uh, at this point, in, uh, in, in several, several occasions, actually in 34, 70, uh, 27, and 26 BC, uh, Octavian actually uh, took into consideration to make to carry out uh, to wage uh, a military expedition against the Britons. Right, um, Ireland into this remains. Uh, Ireland was known as Ibernia at the time, in Latin, um, was uh, completely out of this. Basically, the Romans get interested into Ibernia um, as uh, you know as as long as when they basically conquer Britain and they try to 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 enclose uh, Caledonia, they also don't give uh, much about it. They don't estimate much but the 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 um, Gaelic uh, resistance. They think that they can occupy the island in a very few time, and uh, they would have done it, or seemingly, you know, they sh sh surely sent some detachments there. With there were uh, there were probably some outposts there, but. The objective was chiefly to surround basically Caledonia in order to basically enclose it, and commercially speaking, to oblige it to to have more pressure on it economically speaking. But it's not that they care much about Ireland, although all these lands definitely still gravitated on the empire because still regions like Gaul, even like Spain, that had uh, ancient ties with with Britain and Ireland uh, since very long time, had definitely an economical effect so this is the case of what happens also with other populations up to the Urals in the east is that they know about Rome but effectively Rome doesn't know about them or does bird doesn't care about them um, so this was a, a relatively uh, you know stable frontier simply because there was the sea in the middle so this was the point uh, in the northeast at this point you find Germany now Germany deserves naturally a very important chapter and so we will be discussing this very widely in the future but uh, Germany here takes the name from the, the, the peoples that inhabited them Germany comes from Hermann basically which means or German which means the literally the man of, of the spear that was the name of, of the freeman of the Germanic world um, and that in fact corresponded to a people, to a stock, and this is how the, the ancient peoples consider themselves like territories, physical territories were just uh, praise of conquest. So uh, effectively, Germany was known by like Germania by 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 the Romans, but it's, it's simply because it was populated by the Germans. By the way, at this time, b basically the, the Germans had expanded. You know that in the previous centuries, the Germans are um, descending from the north. Um, most of them come from Scandinavia, and this cent this reg central regions that of Europe that were inhabited by the Celts progressively get Germanized. And in fact, even um, and the Romans in part stem this this thing. Is they stem it in Gaul, they they crush um, Ariovistus, uh, and they. Um, uh, with Caesar and they, they send them as we've seen back them to Germany um, the area of today's southern Germany that would correspond that would be b basically today's Bavaria and Swabia um, that eventually got Germanized in the, during migration in Europe at this time remained Celt uh, Celtic under the, the Roman control south of the Danube um, and they th this Germany in, in, in this period Therefore, comprehends these territories that stretch from the valleys of, of uh, I mean, from the valley of the Rhine to the one of the Danube, to the North Sea, to to the Baltic Sea, and actually, um, it's very easy to understand in the West where, wh what was German and what was not. In the East, it's a bit more complicated. I mean, the, the eastern frontiers of Germany are a bit more mixed up. We actually don't know, even ethnically speaking, what were these Eastern Germans were old kind of Germans from the origins or they were already mixed with our populations were like kind of you know proto-Slavic or some other peoples um, or Celtic there are certain tribes that we basically don't know whether they were Celtic or German uh, this happened also actually also in the West like if you look at the Belgians or the Elvetians 
they, they were probably mostly Celtic, but they, they were blended with the Germans, and actually they consider even themselves on some occasion German because they they felt that the Gauls had grown. I mean, uh, having their their markets open to the Mediterranean trades and having you know living in luxury in, in gold, it was actually richer than, than Germany, getting kind of effeminated or you know not being the, the true warriors of the time. Um, but in this, it's complicated, and uh, modern uh, scholars admit that basically the, the eastern border of Germany was the Vistula River. That is incidentally the the valley, uh, excuse me, the, yeah, the, the, um, into which the valley of which basically the Goths also passed to go to in the east towards, um, towards the, the the what would be the today's the, the Ukraine and the, the Carpathians, etc. Um, so the area of today is Poland, roughly in, in the Vistula River, and um, but it's it's way more complicated. Also to to define who was who there because simply because they were more far from the Roman world. So uh, as far as you get from the Roman raider, um, uh, you 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 don't know much, historically speaking, because m most things we know about these peoples are things that the Greeks and the Romans told us. Um, if the Romans didn't have particular contacts uh, that with other populations, we basically don't know much. In fact, we, we know uh, from the classical times, like very well, uh, I mean relatively well for those times, about peoples like th the Greeks, uh, the Romans, and then we know basically something satisfactory about other 20 peoples slash tribes, but for the rest we, we know almost nothing, basically. Excuse me, I drink a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot because I'm very thirsty, but a, a bit it should be in theory. Yeah. And unfortunately, archaeology doesn't help us a great deal. Archaeology in this sense is, uh, you know, you can find lots of new things, so you can effectively say, okay, this time were peoples that lived like this, have this kind of um, ho uh, houses, and they, they had this kind of economy, but you don't really know who they were. And also genetic material is extremely scarce, to, and extremely also expensive to investigate, so you don't have actual sys massive structural samples that you can analyze and say, oh well, you know, here's that what the people is. You know, without historical sources, basically you don't know anything through archaeology of what these peoples were, um, ethnically speaking. Um, the same um, concept of Celtic and German um, has been a subject to debate recently because um, basically, some scholars came up with the idea that, that these terms were actually a, a classical invention, like the the the, the, uh, the like the, the Germans and the Celts were, you know, basically unaware of their um, com as a wall, let's say, um, as a as a real people on their own, um, in that they were like the, the Romans and the Greeks by commodity were defining them like such. I, I think it's a bit too radical as an explanation, but it has a lot of truth in it. And it would be very interesting to understand what, like especially the Celts, because with the Germans it's, they were actually a bit more geographically compact. Um, Tacitus explains, for instance, that they had always remained isolated and not very mixed. Also because Germany sucked in environmental terms, so nobody went there, didn't mix, didn't blend. With the Celts that effectively stretched from, from Scotland to through through Turkey today, uh, they they it's a bit more complicated, but I still think that there is some sort of common. But even the board boundaries between the Celtic and Germanic world are pretty complicated to 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 assess in many ways, and probably they're not even so important to. And in some cases, it doesn't even make sense. But uh, in my opinion, at least, um, however, this thing has gone a bit too far in the age of multiculturalism, in the sense that we want to stress that basically there is no kind of core identity of these peoples, but in my opinion it's been a bit too excessive. In my opinion also the Germanic, what we, we call as the Germanic populations of the migration era were uh, were not so blended ethnically speaking as we believe, and at least there is no historical re evidence to prove it. And maybe we should go a bit backwards, like saying okay, let's really see what 
the evening is, is and as far as we know, these were kind of Germanic people, so that they were probably an identity. Surely they they uh, built part of their traditions of their identity on the same is, um, classical historiographical ma models when they s effectively settled down. They began to write. These populations were illiterate, so. Uh, there are all these kind of problems. By the way, it's not entirely true that they were illiterate. Obviously, aside from the runic alphabet, etc., we know that the Celts, uh, like many other peoples at the time, knew knew Greek, for knew how to write in Greek. We we get it from the from the the Bello Gallic of Caesar that when he captures the the Alvesian, um baggage train after the uh, the defeat of uh, of these people. Uh, he finds uh, like tablets that were written in Greek that the uh, the Alvesians had had written to before migrating uh, to you know to list all their goods and all this stuff. So that is interesting, but it's still you know you can't talk about a, f a literate society like it. Um, now it's complicated. We can't open a parenthesis on the topic, but I promise I will on another occasion. Um, so, but the, the, to make a long story short, we don't really much know about the perspective of these populations. Albeit the Romans were intrigued with them, Cicero, Augustus, etc., were kind of they knew Druids, for instance. They talk with them, they wrote with them. So this is particularly interesting, and uh, this reveals that probably you know there is a perspective that you don't have to inflate, like saying you know like, like those Celtic fans that you know believe that the Celts were kind of you know light years ahead in technology and compared to the Romans that was stole everything that that's that's rubbish but um, there is still a dimension that unfortunately we will probably never know nothing about that is interesting to 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 think so at this time even uh, so what about Germany in itself so um, sometimes we believe that uh, you know the, the the Romans basically had never seen a German before uh, the 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 Teutonic migrations that effectively invaded uh, places like Noricum, northern Italy, um, southern Gaul, Spain, etc. But the truth is that these populations were actually in great contact with each other since a very long time. Since that even the runic script was partially derived um, in the north by the um, through the contacts with the uh, Etruscans and their alphabet. Uh, so definitely, uh, even before Caesar actually crossed the Rhine, uh, many Roman merchants had ventured into Germany. It was perfectly fine. The Germans had their own. Germany was poor, but they had their trade they had along the Rhine, especially that went up to 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 Norway, through uh, you know through the sea, etc., up to Trondheim. These places. So it was a pretty active. Um, trade that actually the Romans eventually reinforced. I mean, the the, the Roman conquest of of Gaul and the meeting between the, the the Germans and the Romans brought to a growth of trade uh, along the Rhine and all the, and the frontier. Um, we don't know a, a big deal much uh, a big uh, a big deal about the 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 Roman traders, but we definitely find Roman stuff everywhere up to Sweden and far beyond. Actually, up to the Urals, if you want to be honest. So. We know that at least Roman goods arrived till there, and surely the Romans went into the Baltic Sea, etc. Um, the uh, Agrippa actually was the second Roman commander to cross the Rhine with uh, the head of an army. I mean, um, uh, Agrippa had um, basically. Um, in uh, in 38 BC, actually gone to Gaul as proconsul, and then uh, first he had to deal with a with a revolt of the Aquitanians. Then he crossed the Rhine to punish the uh, aggression that the, the Germans. The Germans, yeah, had been kind of as we've said, kind of were uh, uh, as as a mass uh, blocked by Caesar, so that they didn't invade Gaul as they had for uh, they wanted to do. But they still launched uh, on a low, uh, small scale some raids, etc. So especially during the times of the civil war between Octavian and and Antonius, the like they they took the the opportunity of the Roman commitment elsewhere to, to yeah to, to kind of harass the borders and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the uh, 
uh, he uh, Agrippa was actually responsible for the deduction into the Roman territory of the Ubi uh, tribe. Um, uh, by the way, with their own consent, which is interesting because the Ubi um, are one of the is one of the happiest um, um, cases of Romanization uh, of Germans that f felt fully Roman and German at the same time because this was the beauty of, of the Roman citizenship you could be wherever you wanted but and being a Roman citizen it's, it's like today's United States as long as you basically uh, you know you come from everywhere but if you stay to those laws to those standards to those who sp you speak English uh, etc you you can be effectively an American fully and um, that's yeah a nice parallel even if today you know the result is kind of uh, you know, ideological wars going ongoing, uh, but that's in a nutshell. You know what? 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 The beauty of Rome, and also, you know, many universal models are inspired to, in fact. So the Rome made civilization through this, and they will be uh, founded, in fact, a la Ubiorum, that was to become uh, Colonia Agrippina and eventually Cologne. Um, and these were Germans that effectively decided to settle into, say, Roman-controlled territory and to Romanize, right? So with their own consent. Um, so, um, the Romans, as we were saying before, didn't actually create a frontier um, in Augustan times, at least we know nothing about that, because we, as far as we can uh, understand, the, the Rhine was effectively devoid at, at this time of any true defense. We can suppose that uh, Agrippa, during his stay, um, had installed on the left bank of the river Rhine, so in this area of, um, of uh, in fact, which Cologne would rise this tribe of the Ubi, so to, in a, in a defensive fashion, like to say, okay, we settle this tribe in here so that they effectively can block um, the others who want to push westwards tendentially. This was a clever strategy, that's basically what the Romans kept doing for centuries in, into into uh, into Gaul, so another proof that actually the Romans, what happened in the late Roman Empire was nothing new or nothing strange by settling foreign peoples on, on the Roman territories, as long as the state Roman state could assimilate them, it was fine. Then they lost control, but that's uh, another story. Um, so, um, in so containing this Western Germans, so these peoples that were roughly comprehended between the Rhine and the Elbe River, we're talking about the Suebi, the Caninefati, the Catti, the Frisians, the Marcomanni, the uh, Quadi, the Batavians, etc. Um, these were peoples that uh, would remain fundamental in this Western uh, environment, actually. They do, uh, aside from the the Marcomanni, perhaps, and the Quadi. These other peoples remained in the West. They were m many of them would form what in the late Roman Empire would emerge as the Frankish and Alemannic confederacies that we, we, we have discussed on Schwerpunkt. And, and this is interesting because in many ways these were some of the most Romanized tribes, in fact. Even though they didn't quite you know, become Roman at all, actually, wherever stayed, like from the, you know, the right bank of the the Rhine was fundamentally, you know, still leading to. Uh, didn't uh, let's say it's difficult to even to define here. I usually use the term semi-nomadic that can leave some some misunderstanding because you it's very it's a very relative term. But let's say it's not that they started building cities. By the way, you know the the characteristics of the Roman Empire is that whoever they left out of the empire in this, especially in the north. Uh, were not sedentarized peoples because they uh, they were in cities where Roman could maintain their troops and their and the, the and simply the Germans couldn't because they didn't have the resources to, to do it. They effectively lacked the means, even the chemicals to, uh, I mean the substances to to preserve large stocks of food. That's why, for instance, uh, Rome effectively expands as long as they can plant wine yards because with wine with the moist uh, you. Uh, with the um, 
with a must you can uh, create certain products that help even to preserve food etc so the, the Germans couldn't sustain at this time anything larger than a village and that's why they effectively didn't know urbanization the goals had gone far uh, more, more far you know they, they had uh, goal was way richer than Germany was way more advanced uh, the the Celts before the, the Roman conquest had effectively un developing a proto-urban system fundamentally um, they also had a pretty uh, the territory ha the territory helped I mean goal in fact was not Germany w Germany was covered in swamps and in forests was a hell of a place uh, goal w was way rich was extremely fertile rich etc so this had favored um, in turn even the same Roman uh, sedentarization into I mean the same Roman conquest of Gaul and the ability to maintain it because the Romans at that point had the, the, the necessary supplies etc in fact the legions Rome stationed on the Rhine were mostly fed with all these enormous Gallic agricultural resources and they would remain for a very long time um, and but and say that on the long run very slowly uh, this Western Germans especially but also others um, resent of the effects of of Rome like it's as if there was emanati this emanatistic influence of Rome on these populations that in a way or in another uh, both politically and militarily but also in terms of trade and material culture r you know feel the the presence of Rome so that um, at the times of uh, time of Augustus the Romans uh, excuse me the Germans were effectively uh, primitives with clubs literally that hadn't basically even entered the Iron Age um, and by the third century you have you know confederations with you know certain s social certification with with armor that is even you know similar to actually identical to the Roman one even if they didn't quite have uh, you know they were still semi-nomadic didn't have quite a of, of, of urbanization or anything but I'd say that the Romans had helped these peoples even in order to control them better to to a bit to centralize their power and therefore to create you know uh, more developed hi hierarchies and uh, you know um, control on the resources uh, etc at the time of Augustus the, the, the Germans were quite primitive and they were also in this sense very difficult to Romanize and that's why effectively Rome was to abandon Germany after the the um, Clades Varian after the, the disaster of the uh, of the Teutoburg force um the um and then and the romans in this sense also never gave up to conquer germany i mean germany could be effectively conquered at least another two occasions or even more i mean for some time the romans said okay we, we have to reconquer germany then they had other things to think about they realized probably was not worth the pain is it's simply a, a simply a, um a, a ratio costs benefits that's how the romans literally reasoned the romans are probably the most pragmatic people you ever find on earth yet uh, still under Marcus Aurelius um, and under Max, uh, Maximinus the Thracian the Romans thought about invading Germany like literally you know the, the once uh, the world Germany like the one comprehended between the Rhine and the Elbe um, in fact if Marcus Aurelius had not died uh, if the plague had not struck the Empire uh, you know he was effectively preparing the invasion of Germany so after the Mac Marcomannic Wars etc um, so it was still plausible, and still, if you think about Maximin the Thracian during the third century, yeah, yeah, Rome uh, effectively had the military potential to invade whichever people they wanted at this time. The problem was keeping them. That is the point. It's, it's extremely naive to believe that Rome didn't have the military potential to conquer places like I don't know Caledonia. Uh, it's ridiculous. Not, uh, not, but not even in Germany. The problem was what, what on the long run? What on the long run? And um, uh, and yeah, so this is actually a complex uh, topic. I don't know how far I should go with it, but it's very definitely very fascinating, at least. Um, the the reason, in fact, why the Romans uh, the Romans conquer Germany, as we have seen, they conquer Germany with Tiberius when he was still not emperor. Um, there were had other preparatory. Um, conquests and 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 Rome basically at this point conquered everything the stretch between the Rhine and the Elbe but 
Rome didn't give a damn about these areas because they were like so poor and primitive that they thought also they were harmless. Um, and this is effectively true. I mean, the, the poorest areas at this point didn't have much of an invading potential. It's not the, the, the Germans. Uh, the Germans took centuries before they could have the forces, even in, in relation to, to the Roman ones, to, to attempt this mass scale invasions that they wouldn't basically achieve them until the 5th century. Um, but the so for like in fact f half of a millennium but the um the concept is that the romans had conquered this area of germany not because they were much interested into it but because were actually worried about another um a, a specific part of the germanic area that was the the southeastern one the um the marcomannic confederacy basically that stretched these territories across between what would be today's um, uh, Czech Republic and uh, other uh, regions of Central Europe that were occupied by this Marcomannic Confederation that in fact was one of the most, uh, was actually the only threat to the Roman borders at this time. And, and in fact the Roman the even the Battle of Teutoburg Forest happened in these movements of the Roman military across these areas and they weren't even about the whole thing it was to crush the Marcomannic Confederacy uh, actually the other Germans didn't like the Marcomanni uh, much uh, another fact that prevented effectively the the Germany to be conquered is that the Great Illyrian Revolt that happened in the same years so that the Romans had to commit an enormous amount of troops seemingly Rome had never uh, put on the field as many troops as um, as uh, as in that occasion uh, after the Second Punic War, but this might be an exaggeration. But nevertheless, the the Great Illyrian Revolt was was quite of a big thing uh, at the time. So with with the disaster of the Teutoburg Forest, uh, at one point they said, okay, let's stop this, let's abort this, let's call it off. And eventually, it was all the matter of recovering the uh, the three legionary eagles and all this stuff. So um, and other problems around the empire that effectively brought the Romans to the side, okay, you know what, let's stop here. Also because, as we were saying before, the Romans didn't have quite clear how big was actually Central Europe, as and that they kind of understood it along, s along the way. Um, if it hadn't been for these events, Germany could be Romanized, and I don't know with how many benefits for Rome, because actually this was an area that uh, that was very difficult to Romanize. The Romans Romanized, as we've seen before, to the cooptation of the elites, but also chiefly through trade and material culture. And the Germans weren't much open to Roman model, not as much as the Caledonians were. They didn't care, actually, so it would have been extremely difficult to, to Romanize an area uh, like Germany was also so depressed. So the Romans basically said, you know, we have to invest an enormous quantity of resources to, to the forest state, um, to, to clear all this land, to dry up the swamps, to, to build cities, uh, there is a very few resources, so you know what, let's give it up. And it was probably for the best, because um, if the Romans had to, co to, to maintain Germany within their frontiers, they would have necessarily had to shift the, the limits towards, uh, on the Elbe River at least, or the Vistula. Uh, the idea was to make the Vistula to the Emperor um, axe uh, the frontier, so encompassing the whole Central Europe and just effectively going against the enemies of the steppes. Um, I mean, at least shielding themselves from, from them, because the Romans were definitely not interested to expand into the steppes. Um, but this would have created enormous problems, enormous costs. They would have had at all times basically the Germans on, on their back and these terrible enemies of the steppes in the front. So it would have been a disaster. So the Romans were smart enough to 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 back off of Germany and to to consolidate and to control the Germans through this, in fact, decentralized uh, government by uh, basically controlling their elites. Um, German chieftains were regularly educated in Rome, just like Arminius uh, and his brother that was effectively a Roman, a very faithful Roman soldier. Um, and so uh, these are important elements to consider that you never hear aside from the nationalistic vulgata either from from both sides and nobody cares uh, 
about it historically speaking, or at least too many people care about that because simply because they don't know the history behind that. Um, so, going uh, say towards uh, the Alps, we find this area that is often a very overlooked frontier because people look at the map and say, you know what, uh, here the, the Rome basically uh, there weren't internal frontiers, right? Like, the Romans conquered all, and all it matters is the border. Other mistake. There were internal frontiers, actually. And one of these was the ones of the Alps. The one of the Alps. Um, the, um, uh, the Alps are this imposant um, geographical bulwark that effectively divides um, Italy from Central Europe, from, from Gaul, etc. But and there are passages, of course, that are uh, the sea primarily with Gaul, and there are several uh, valleys and passes, etc. The problem is that there were peoples inhabiting these areas, and um, the Alpine area is, uh, is very fascinating because it was mostly a Celtic area, uh, generally speaking. Uh, even though there were many peoples that were far more ancient and about which we don't really know what ethnicity they were, M many of them had got Celticized. Mm? So they weren't quite uh, Celtic, uh, maybe in the origin, but they had assumed this phase of, of Celticity. Think about the Ratsians, that effectively nobody knows where they actually came from. There were many peoples in the, the ancient world, we don't know where they actually came from, like the Etruscans, the Ligurians, the Basques, etc. Some of them also inhabited the Alps including the Ligurians, for instance, the stretch between Italy and the Gaul. Um, and, they, and there were these two very important um, passes in, in, in Rezia, or Raetia, as could be called, that are, in fact, the, um, the lesser, the little and great San Bernard passes. Um, these were uh, obliged points of, of passage, uh, for the numerous Roman merchants that had to pass, especially through, um, I mean, b from Italy, uh, I mean, uh, between Italy and the, the, the Transalpine uh, lands. And uh, these Alpine peoples are actually extremely divided because the, the, the mountaineers are living in these valleys that are effectively, you know, a wall valley is, is, a, is a, uh, you know, uh, every valley is a wall in another world for each one who lives in there. So they were very closed and retired. They were actually it was very difficult to, to go up there. Mm. Uh, crossing the Alps has been, you know, even in military history something extremely difficult until think about even Napoleon or etc. It's something that at the time was a, a true enterprise. And the these peoples lived very much isolated. I mean they were quite close to Italy, to Gaul, so this very kind of advanced places, but they they seem to be untouched by it. These people seem to be attached at it by it. And uh, n naturally they were uh, terrestrial peoples, I mean they they just lived of the activities of um, transportation via land, and they also exploited some uh, mineral resources, and they, they definitely had tr um, other activities, chiefly, chiefly, uh, you know, livestock and stuff, stuff like that, and these were individually uh, and demographically speaking, absolutely no problem for Rome. But the problem is, it, it was that they were located into areas that were very difficult to control, because even the Roman legions had problem to reach the top of these mountains, the, the, this reach these valleys. And it's very easy at this time to control the Alpine pass, just like today, by the way, to control the Alpine passes and to to block effectively and advance. So Rome was um, handled these peoples quite carefully. They actually there were some military campaigns against them, but they were pretty rare. For the most, Rome just saw it fit to to give them large autonomy and to let the Roman merchant pass. And uh, the Romans effectively progressively Romanized these areas. I think that the last populations that were that resisted uh, kind of as independent remained in the Alps until the time of Nero. Um, uh, and they simply, you know, they, they kind of Romanized over time so that yeah, the part of their primitiveness was lost. But, you know, 
alpine communities remained isolated also for many centuries historically and they had all their own histories and traditions etc and they existed as a frontier let's say then there is another forgotten frontier that I don't know why it is forgotten because it was effectively one of the most important ones and it would grow increasingly in importance which is effectively the Danubian Basin um, the Danubian Basin was um, um, uh, in the western part inhabited by especially in the in Re uh, Russia or Raitia and uh, or Rezia if you prefer and Noricum uh, inhabited by Celtic and later a bit also Germanic population uh, in the central part um, once again by Celts those were very heavily Celticized areas because the Celts had migrated basically across the, the Danube uh, reaching reaching the Black Sea and, and, and Anatolia but also by the Illyrians so the Dalmatians the also the Pannonians Pannonians probably were mixed with Cel Celtic more Celtic than anything and more east like in the lower Danube um, the Thracians so the Mesians the Jetians the Dacians um, and partly some other Germans like or seemingly Germans like the Bastarnae for, for example now we have lots of difficulties even here to tell who was who because these were heavily Celticized areas and most of these populations were actually really Celtic and they were extremely warlike by the way they, they, in Augustian times it took literally tens of Roman legions to subdue populations like the Pannonians nobody gives a damn about them uh, just like nobody gives some damn to the northern Iberian tribes um, they were also kind of Celtic in nature um, and unjustifiably I mean we know everything about the Britons because you know Britain came to be the center of the world <laughs> eventually in history and uh, but uh, so we know everything about the British Celts they were kind of the least uh, you know developed and or also least offensive populations in the Celtic world and we completely lacked uh, any memory of, uh, of of this Danubian Celts they were actually extremely fierce populations were extremely cohesive and 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 Coriaceous and they they really troubled the Romans for a lot of time it took a lot of time in to, to Romanize them and this areas never quite got fully Romanized even the the Illyrian interland remained still a very pr primitive and you know just superficially if not at all Roman uh, Romanized area um, the uh, these peoples had actually created problems as well just like the Germans about the, the Bastarne, I wanted just to add that uh, the, uh, the we don't actually know whether they were German or, or Celts. Some say no, the preferentially they were German, but I don't think there is actually any evidence of this. We only know that they were particularly fierce. They were considered reputed the best mercenaries of the ancient world by certain standards. But but these are also relative phrases that. These were still primitive peoples, and as primitive peoples, they could be very resilient, but still not a big deal in strategic terms. Uh, in, you know, they they couldn't really pose enormous stress to the Romans. Then there were the Dacians, that, as we know, were uh, more advanced because they actually had um, a lot of mining centers that eventually will attract Rome, that would launch under Trajan the campaign to to conquer Dacia. They were kind of more advanced uh, than the average they had a kind of a kingdom for real on their own they they were also shielded effectively by their Carpathian um, uh, mountains and they 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 were pretty pretty advanced and they had ancient ties since it's you know more ancient uh, since the classical age with with the Greeks with their trade etc so there is a deal of even Hellenization of these populations excuse me I drink a little once again And um, some of these populations had also carried out raids against the Roman provinces. For instance, this happened in Macedonia between 29 and 28 BC. And they were also more politically organized than uh, the other, like the Western uh, Celts or or the Germans at this point 
um, and um, and there are pretty intense relations also with the Romans, um, and especially with Noricum uh, in the what would be today's uh, Austria, basically in the the the, the mountain area. Um, Noricum was famous for its uh, iron smiths. This was the center of Celtic uh, armories. The Romans um, uh, prized very much the 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 Celtic um, Calbis Noricum that was uh, iron with you know pretty uh, substantial, um, pretty effective, let's say, rate of of carbon in in that. It, it technically, would be the result is this debate whether can we call it steel? Well, yeah. I mean, if you take the the modern industrial you know standards, nothing existed. <laughs> not even in Middle Ages is is effectively steel anymore. But yeah, it was kind of steel. It's at least it it was for those time standards. It was some of the most uh, effective uh, metal there uh, league there to to make armor and weapons. In fact, the Romans. <laughs> Chiefly for for their armors and and, and weapons extracted uh, this iron from from Noricum and as far as I know in Austria today uh, the, the 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 mines I mean at least the region where these mineral centers exist still exist today. However, the center of European metallurgy would shift towards the in the migration era from from Noricum into the Upper Rhine Valley effectively and part of this Celtic know-how was effectively inherited by, by the Germans, but the, the, the Nori, in this sense, were, were lo uh, old allies, excuse me, old allies of Rome, and they had effectively been um, kind of a friend, you know, Rome Rome had some friends, uh, some historical friends, we're thinking about the Edui, for instance, or Aidui, if, if you prefer, in central Gaul, the, you know, these relations existed even before the Roman invasion, and it was not all about war. It was also about friendship or better alliance that was necessary, as you can imagine. So we have seen Europe, and let's pass to uh, to to Asia, to the eastern frontier of the empire. Um, so at the end of the civil wars, uh, Rome has effectively, you know, consolidated his positions into the east. Um, it's a kind of a decentralized government because the Romans in the East had wanted to imitate the Alexandrine model, according to which basically um, there is no need to sh to to shed blood. I mean, the the local populations should always already recognize you as the power that you are, and this is kind of normal for peoples that are um, you know used to pharaohs and uh, uh, kings of kings, etc. Although things are a bit more complicated, chiefly because these are uh, Mediterranean lands, and the Mediterranean lands were very much advanced at this time. Uh, the, the core of the empire is Mediterranean, and this Hellenistic world, especially of the East, that is extremely rich, and especially in, in, in money. While the, the the actual manpower and agricultural, uh, actually, yeah, well, the chiefly manpower of the empire is in still in the West. And and it would remain for for long. Actually, uh, Italy loses its centrality just in the third century, effectively, but still remaining quite important. So um, um, so it's easy to to move in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Romans basically conquer the Mediterranean pretty quickly, and they sometimes they they don't even need to fight for it. They they can literally just buy kingdoms. Uh, or are places, um, and they can easily maneuver there. I mean, the Mediterranean, even still at this time, is, um, I mean, already at this time, is uh, effectively crossable in, in a few days. Like, I think from Ostia to Alexandria, Egypt, it was like just one week or something like that. I mean, uh, or maybe no, maybe more, but, you know, a very few time, as you understand. So, Rome had kind of absorbed these areas pretty quickly. And it didn't need a, a big deal of military promise, uh, presence, actually, if not in places like Egypt that was strategically vital for the empire because it was the granary of the empire, effectively now. Um, controlling it meant to 
have the, the the mob in Rome well fed, uh, this was crucial to govern it, etc. Um, but looking at frontiers, which is what interests us, uh, the Parthians. So I don't think I have to introduce the Parthians. This were some this Iranian population that had, set, uh, ha had settled a um, couple of centuries before into the Iranian plateau and had began to expand into, I mean, from the steppes uh, into the Iranian plateau and then to expand into Mesopotamia. That it was effectively uh, you know uh, d d d one of the most one of the most fertile and, r and, and richest advanced areas of the world at this time and um, the Romans had been defeated in 53 uh, BC as we all know at the Battle of Carre um, which was a pretty heavy defeat in numerical terms but as we were saying before Rome didn't have any problem with recruitment at that point after the Marian reform they could I mean, it was a massive defeat, but it didn't basically change much. If not the fact that the Romans now considered the Parthians as their uh, greatest enemies. Uh, the, ba the Battle of Carre is often, or Carre if you prefer, is often interpreted like, I don't know, the, the Parthians were undefeatable on in open field, but this is, this is garbage. It, it is not the case. The Romans got annihilated there simply because the Parthians outsmarted them. They destroyed their Gallic cavalry and they basically just remained, uh, you know, just found the Roman infantry to, to target with their uh, horse archers and making, you know, this uh, hit and run tactics with alternating arrows with cataphract charges, you know, fake cataphract charges, by the way, because they didn't necessarily have to impact, they just had to approach the enemy to make it close in, I mean, to, to re, uh, to, to, uh, recompacting the ranks so that the horse archers could shoot once again inside them and to massacre them like that. But this was not the normality and actually um, the Romans adapted pre pretty quickly, um, if not immediately, at the uh, eastern tactics that required this big deal of especially of archery, uh, mobility, etc. Um, but even and more, more importantly at a strategic level the Parthians weren't a big deal. I mean, literally, uh, until the Sassanid. Uh, at this time, the Parthians were ruled by the Arsacids. Then, effectively, Persia came to be co ruled by the Sassanid dynasty in the third, early third century, and this changed everything, both tactically and strategically. I made a video on the on the Sassanid Persian army uh, as an introduction uh, that explains a bit these things. But at this point party effectively cannot threaten Rome. I mean, definitely, uh, this is complex to, to say bec because naturally Rome is way larger, more powerful, etc. The Parthians do not. But the Parthians are also relatively bad at, at doing what they do. But, but there is one thing they... because... Uh, okay, we can't talk in depth about this now because the video is already long enough the way it is and we still have a lot to say. But let's say that they didn't have such a great strategical effectiveness they weren't a great problem for uh, fortified centers. They were mocked around the ancient world because they weren't uh, seemingly ineffective in siege warfare, which is, uh, as many, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, anecdotes of the ancient world, a bit of a caricatural way to, to say more deeper things, that is essentially that these were the party, uh, the, the Parthians came from the, the Parnians. So these peoples of the steppes were not used to siege warfare, of course, because in the steppes there are no <laughs> cities. Um, and uh, and therefore, this time, the, the, the Parthians kind of had problems, and simply, seemingly the, the, the Persians just uh, got skilled in siege warfare because of Roman turncoats or prisoners that eventually told uh, much later the, the Persians how to, to, to build and man siege weaponry and stuff like that. It's a kind of a, you know, simplistic interpretation, but it's not that far from truth. And effectively, Parthia is much smaller. The, the great problem with the with Rome is that Parthia stays in the middle into the great Central Asian trade routes between Rome and China that both empires were, you know, extremely um, determined to keep open. So the Parthians basically stood in the middle exacting tolls from this, uh, the Silk Road uh, merchants and travelers and therefore create, you know, effectively drying up many resources that instead the Romans and the Chinese wanted for, for themselves. 
this was the real deal um, and, and therefore the Romans for, for Carret it was definitely a shame uh, a dishonor in military history etc and, and, and for this other broader strategic reason um, wanted the Parthians to, to be knocked out the, the problem is that you can't invade Parthia because it's the Iranian plateau and the Iranian plateau is one of the worst possible places where to fight ever in history so the Romans basically contented themselves in containing them the, the rule of Armenia and the Mesopotamian uh, areas where they wanted to expand and um, and there were several you know both Caesar and uh, Mark uh, Mark Antony wanted to uh, to crush the Parthians Similarly, Caesar died just before uh, leaving for, for the Parthian uh, campaign that probably would have been a, a failure. Actually, it's, it was better for Caesar to have died the way he did. Might have been even kind of sick and about to die. So his death was more glorious than maybe just, you know, dying of dysentery in, in, in the Syrian desert. Um, but Mark Antony also, when, the, when there was the, triun the second triumvirate and he got the east, you know, he fought against it, but he had necessarily to and uh, and it was tough there, so there were many other clashes with the Parthians, but nothing that escalated into something bigger that threatened the, the Roman domination of the Near East at all um, but there is f one thing you have to give to the Parthians is that basically never gave up the idea that they could contend uh, with Rome the control of, to Rome the control of the Near East and its trade routes, and, and, and they never gave up, and this is a bit in a nutshell the Iranian perspective, <laughs> you know, still today, you know, the idea is that, that whatever rules from Persia has historically the idea that, you know, that's their regional power, they have to, to, to create an empire to control it, we are seeing it, just read today's news and all, and, 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 and that's effectively what th they never cease to, to think, um, also because uh, the Parthians were a bit far from it, but let's say that the the model of the uh, the old Achaemenid Empire had made school, let's say, and you know these uh, these peoples were effectively in love with the idea of the universal empire on their own, etc. So um, a great deal of the conflict had to do naturally with with uh, because of uh, with Armenia that the Arsacids and Rome wanted to to control. Armenia was effectively a, a vassal state other of, of one of the other or one of or the Rome uh, or, or, or or Parthia. Um, and the Syrian frontier that was wider but generally, you know. Um, and, and what the Parthians do at this point is that they exited their uh, from from one century effectively, if not a bit more, from the strictly uh, Iranian dimension and they started expanding into Mesopotamia and they in fact uh, settled their capital in Ctesiphon that will effectively become the uh, the the Arsacid, uh, remain the Arsacid eventually also the Sassanid capital that the Romans will storm twice actually so you know the, the Romans actually did pretty bad <laughs> you know uh, did did pretty good actually. I mean, uh, but you know, they they definitely harmed the the, the Parthians for for goods uh, on more than one occasion. In Ctesiphon was this city post on one of the essential. Um, um, I don't know how you say that. Uh, the stop let's put it in this way on the silk road so this was a um, I mean a further evolution from the semi-nomadic uh, Iranic view of the Parthians in the in turning to something more um, imperial and sanitary and urbanized that that in this sense recalled also the old Achaemenid Empire then um, in the east there were the uh, also the Arabs so um, the uh, the Arab tribe uh, that was the uh, that was the closest to the Roman Empire was the uh, Nabataeans. So the Nabataeans basically live uh, within the caravan routes that um, revolve around the city of Petra. 
and this was a, an extremely important center of uh, redistribution of products, especially of luxury products, so frankincense, silk, spices, all this stuff that came from the, the Indian, the Arab and the African world. So this was an extre uh, extremely important center uh, in terms of, of trade and controlling it was important. So the Romans can of um, more or less control this area. They don't have many problems with the Nabataeans. And also because these are another kind of you know relatively weak uh, population. Um, and what is often forgotten of the Arabian dimension is that uh, south of Nabatea, in south of the uh, Hijaz, let's say, uh, in the we uh, in the southwest of, of, of Arabia, there is the so-called the dreamland of Arabia Felix, like the Roman called it. So, the prosperous, the, the happy, the um, Arabia. That would be today's Yemen. Um, this is an area that actually saw a, a big deal of civilization development, historically speaking. We don't we don't know excessively much about them, um, about uh, about Arabia Felix, but we know that it was populated by the sub bands um, that were this uh, you know they, they had the urbanization, they had the the, the the great dam of um, I forgot the name Mahab. I don't really remember that gave this that has uh, um, granted immense agricultural resources for those area standards. They have an influence also in northeast Africa. They control the Strait with the Red Sea, etc. And from the other side of Arabia, on the east, you have uh, Gera, that is uh, the 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 land, uh, the the city, the land of Gerans that were considered the richest of all peoples by in the Ro like Strabo wrote. Um, so uh, these were countries that Rome effectively never reached, but that they did live at the frontiers of Rome, if anything, because they were connected by it through the sea, chiefly. It was not a matter of land, just obviously there was a land dimension of this, but uh, these were effectively some of the greatest centers of trade in the ancient world, and the Romans admired, in this sense, their, uh, their wealth. Uh, it's not that effectively they ever gave rise to you know enormous amp uh, like things like empires etc politically they were also relatively unstable etc but they were definitely very advanced and the romans were fascinated with them because they thought they were extremely rich and and whatever they were they were very very important I for international trade because all the stuff that came from china from india passed through these uh, ways um, so, um, passing to Africa, which is also another forgotten frontier, uh, you will realize, first of all, on a map that basically Rome doesn't go far south, right? You know, if you look, there is the Mediterranean, right? And if you compare the lands uh, on the southern shore of the Mediterranean, one of the northern shore of the Mediterranean, realize that the Romans go far in the north um, they uh, they they go you know several several hundreds of kilometers sometimes even thousand and or more uh, and expanding towards the north because these were kind of temperated areas that were sort of fertile etc with Africa it's not like that because the Romans have this mostly coastal control of Africa and then the interland is effectively desertic or semi-arid at least and therefore there is nothing to conquer where the, the Ro Rome has um, I mean no place where the Roman system the political social economical system of Rome can effectively work so um, there is only one way that goes uh, far south let's say and that therefore attracts a bit more the attention of the Romans and that had been effectively um, looked upon with um, with lust also by the since the ancient times by the Persians, by the, the Hellenistic empires, there was Nubia, so in the southeast of, of, of North Africa. Um, so Lower Nubia is um, a bit less advanced. It's basically Nubia is south of Egypt, right? Would be today's um, uh, space comprehended between Egypt and Sudan, right? And, and this first um, band, let's say the south of Egypt, 
um, is populated by several populations, chiefly the Blemmi, or or Blemme, I don't know, remember how it's uh, said. I'm saying here, but we don't know really much about them. They're actually kind of semi-nomadic tribal population. They were nothing deal, but this they're still were a bit uh, a problem because they lived into this kind of uh, wild areas, and they 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 their movements were controlled by Rome because they could effectively um, close the, the context between Egypt and, and Nubia. Um, southwards to this there is um, the Ethiopian kingdom of Omeroi that would be uh, roughly corresponding to today's Sudan. Um, this area is uh, of northeastern Africa is mm, particularly interesting because historically um, has uh, aside from Egypt is perhaps the, the the region of Africa that has more to do with the rest of Asia uh, and in that resented even ethnically speaking uh, of the uh, of the contact with the other populations um, it's also relatively fertile in, in certain areas um, and, and therefore historically there, there is a of a more developed civilization developing there. There is even a sort of centralized kingdom that is strong enough at one time um, um, to launch um, some military expedition up to Roman Egypt. This happens when the Romans conquer Egypt for the first time so the Nubians are triggered by this and they go there to see if there is some opportunity um, to um, uh, with uh, Candace, I think was the queen uh, that might even as well not existed in Augustian times. They arrive in Egypt. They saw that there are the Romans. The Romans defeat them actually, <laughs> because they weren't actually a big uh, big deal. Or and, and therefore there is this agreement between Rome and Nubia that basically is not broken. Uh, anymore for centuries. This is typical of several of, of the relation with Rome with the African kingdoms because they are less relatively, they are relatively less, to m I mean, dynamic, and they're smart enough to also to say, okay, let's just, okay, the Romans arrived before there were Ptolemies in Egypt, but now there are the Romans. Let's just trade with them. This is an interesting perspective, in my opinion, because um, um, this. This country of Nubia um, could have been conquered by the Romans. I mean, if you look at it in strategic perspective, you realize it, it, it didn't take much to do it. Uh, there were uh, had been other empires who had effectively tried military expeditions into Nubia. The Romans don't. The Romans sent um, some explorers um, to go search for the uh, springs of the Nile that are f very far south in Africa, as you know. Uh, they seemingly didn't come back with an answer. They find this river is extremely long, and um, and um, but other empires did launch military operations. The reason why probably Nubia w didn't is that Rome was too close to it to um, to really pose a real threat. I mean, uh, to uh, excuse me to to make it convenient for the Nubians to to be too autonomous. Like with the Persians, for instance, like Persia is very far from countries like Ethiopia, right? Um, the Persians tried, but they failed. I made a, a, a video about this on the Nubian in Cersei's army, something like that. If you are interested about it, I explained that. Rome is closer. Rome can intervene more readily. So at that point, probably these African people say, you know what, it's useless for me to fight against Rome. Because now Rome, by the way, controls all the trade routes that go from Africa into the Mediterranean. The the Persians didn't at the time because they were far eastwards. So at this point, rebelling against Rome is for what, or being a threat for Rome against what? What for? Uh, also, the the Ethiopian kingdom wasn't this enormously developed center, so also their resources were relatively limited, uh, in spite of their average development. Then. Um, that made them, I mean, the, their development made them stand out compared to the other African um, powers, but, um, you know, was no reason. And if in fact, if you look at Roman history, the fact that the, the such 
political entities remained at peace for, for, for literally for centuries tells you that even if there had to be logics out there that made them senseless to, to, to create problems, right? Everybody thinks about being uh, prosper and the Romans are not interested to annihilate this place. It j they're just happy uh, if they let pass, um, you know, uh, precious resources, trade resources from from Black Africa into their the market there, into it towards Egypt, etc. So it's not a big problem to Arabia, etc. Uh, in fact, this area of the uh, Horn of Africa is pretty close to Arabia as well. So there was all a kind of a connected trade that went from South Africa along the coast towards towards, uh, in fact, Ethiopia, and then from there in the Red Sea, and uh, and Petra and Egypt, and so on. So that was Rome was interested in. Um, and um, and in fact, this is the real importance of Nubia, is that it's the great connection between the Mediterranean world and Black Africa. Because um, through the Nile, it's way easier to to make goods pass than through the Sahara <laughs> in, in the West. So you can understand that uh, there were naturally uh, um, trade uh, routes passing through the Sahara as well, but they were relatively uh, thinner. If it hadn't been for the precious stones like gold from Senegal and all these places, it would have been so important after all. Through Nubia passed lots of things, uh, chiefly uh, gold also in here, slaves, um, they they went from uh, Nubia and they passed through uh, Aswan and then towards Alexandria, all, all through the Nile, as you can understand. Then, last but not least, the Sahara that we have just named. So, what is interesting about the Sahara is that uh, there's a lot of sand. <laughs> Apparently, it's very hot. It's very dry. Well, not just that. Um, actually, these areas were populated, especially closer to the North African coast. Um, but the Romans, d in fact, didn't care much about the desert in itself. In fact, uh, contrarily wise to popular belief, even in these maps that I've presented to you, there is uh, written something like uh, the African desert or something like that, but it's, it, it's not true. Uh, the Romans didn't even have a name, in Latin at least, to, to define to define the Sahara. Um, and the Romans effectively talked about solitudinous, which means basically uh, it's it's difficult to to translate, but it, it, it literally means kind of a desolated place. I mean, a place where there is effectively no one. Um, on some maps you find, even medieval manuscripts, something like uh, Ic sunt leones, which literally means here are the lions, <laughs> because they understood that uh, far south of Sahara, within the uh, s uh, savannas uh, areas, there are there are lions. And th there are the, the savannas were actually populated by you know certain kingdoms. Let's say that were also kind of, and they were effectively the ones that traded through the Sahara routes with the Mediterranean. Um, but the Romans were more than else in contact with these populations that inhabited the uh, eastern and southern coasts of the uh, Great Sirte. Um, there were several uh, here. Th there were the Nasamonians. There were a local Berber, I believe, population. Um, definitely, yes. I don't think there were other Tunisians there, and in the in the west and in kind of southwest, more in, in the interland, in the Fezzan, Hainans were the Garamantians. Um, south of Numidia, there was part of the Roman Empire, there were uh, uh, Getulia or Getulia, um, were there were nomads or semi nomads, wherever you want to call them, that lived along the side, this borders of Numidia and Mauritania. There were other peoples like the Farusi, etc. But there were several peoples that I mean, some of them got more famous. The the, the Romans actually launched once the uh, an expedition against against the Garamantians, and seemingly there they uh, annihilated their major trade center. Also, th these populations weren't urbanized. 
but I had their own kind of settlements. Um, so it happened in there, but also these populations remained relatively um, relatively happy and interesting. Uh, I mean, happy. What am I saying? <laughs> the video is getting too long. What I meant is that they they got relatively. They remained uh, in at peace with Rome. I mean, there was no reason to for them to risk annihilation by harassing the Roman frontiers. And what is fascinating is that these populations set themselves in motion just during the migration era to prove that the migration era was also not just triggered by external factors but also because effectively the Roman Empire was in crisis by itself so peoples from all over these frontiers put themselves in motion and I don't think that, I don't know, the the, the Berbers knew had these excessive contacts, I don't know, with the Sassanids or the Germans for which they, <laughs> you know, cooperated but uh, there is still this um, perspective and and there were many other peoples uh, whose names we don't really know um, and especially whose location on the on the map we don't really know uh, also because probably these were moving uh, they were semi um and and therefore they changed their they had also their wars their clashes that Rome naturally always controlled we, we didn't get much information about this but this was really how things worked um, and um, Rome uh, most of the times was was able to just to to freeze them because you know the, their wars could put at risk also in here once again the trade rows um, and these are all kind of nomadic or semi nomadic shepherds the live of livestock and uh, sometimes they harassed the sanitary settlements in the coastal towns but they, they were they weren't more anything more than kind of brigands or stuff like that sometimes yeah there were walled tribes that put themselves in motion but the romans could actually shoo them away back into the desert pretty pretty easily and in fact the the north african frontier is kind of the the one in which the romans invest the least there were only like one legion in africa or two i don't remember i think only once so just for telling you that that was the deterrent power that was enough to to keep things uh okay and uh they and these populations were in contact in turn and therefore intermediaries for the romans with areas like chad or niger and controlling the straight routes in the uh, for the rest they okay we will think we can stop here Th naturally the, there, are, there are many other peoples who were in contact with Rome maybe we will see it in another occasion actually beyond the frontier so uh, there are naturally populations like uh, you know the 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 Slavs, the Proto-Slavs, the Bals, the Finns, also the Bastarnae, the, but also India or China, we will see them later. Um, for now I think we can stop it here. Um, this was part of the uh, new series I'm starting on Roman history that I see that interests several of you and therefore I thought to start with this today, this topic and I hope that you liked this video if you did please um, I mean I hope that you enjoyed this video if you if you did please uh, share it or was leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye